Hello everybody, today I have a video for you about SwiftUI, SwiftUI's AnyView and the View Builder annotation. But I just don't want to tell you which one you need to use for each scenario, I want to give you the background about it, why the difference exists and basically give you the tools so you can pick by yourself. So let's dive in and explore how SwiftUI works. So let us start with this SwiftUI view. One of the main differences about SwiftUI to other UI declarative frameworks is that SwiftUI uses the power of Swifts to its fullest. Basically, it uses the type system to encode the representation of your view hierarchy, and that unlocks a full set of performance improvements and it has huge potential. So let's take a look at that, how it works, to try to understand it properly. When you're working with SwiftUI, you are using the Swift UI DSL, which is using function builders, and I have a video about it to, that will tell you how the Swift function builders work to do this nice syntax without returns and all this. So let's start by embedding this in a B stack and adding another view. Once we have this, we can see that Swift UI is actually embedding on the type system, so the return type of this property it's representing the entire hierarchy. We can see it on the playground here. Basically, you can see that it's a B stack with a tuple view and a text and an image. If you're not using the playground, there is a nice trick that you can do, which is just change the type of this. And basically, you're gonna have obviously a compiler error, but this compiler error, it's gonna tell you which type you're returning. You can see here that we have an exact representation of what we are defining as the view hierarchy. We have a B stack, so that's the top type that we are returning, and that B stack is generic. It's generic over a specific view type, and it's a tuple view, because we have two views inside the B stack. And then that tuple view is composed of text and image. So Swift UI at this point, the compiler has all the knowledge it needs to know fully what view we are trying to represent. But since changing this return type, it's kind of annoying. Let's add a modifier so we can see it in on the console every time. Let's just paste this here, which is something I use uh, in other projects. And thanks to this, we can now use a debug type here. And when we run it, we're going to see on the console the same information, but then we don't have to mess with the compiler, forcing it to, to show us an error. So we have here, and we know that the Swift compiler now has all the knowledge it needs to do the best it can to optimize this. And we're talking about optimization, what are we talking about? When you are using a declarative UI framework, there are always two things going on. One is the existing thing that it's on the screen right now. So right now on the screen, SwiftUI knows that we're displaying a text and an image. And then every time that something happens and something needs to change and update what's on the screen, SwiftUI performs a diff, a diffing algorithm. What that does is it checks the new state that we're giving, so the new UI hierarchy that we're giving it, compared to the old one, the one that's already existing on the screen. That diff can be costly, but it can also be optimized. And it, Swift UI and any declarative framework, what it's gonna try to do is just change the small amount of things that needs to change to get from the old state to the new state. Swift UI, thanks to having all the knowledge about the type system, it's easy to imagine that in this case, if we try to re-render something, the effort is minimum because it knows that the B stack has the same number of elements it knows that nothing inside can change. The only thing that can really change is the content of the views. But the views themselves, you don't have to add views, subtract views, relay out things just for the views. You just need to take care of the content of them. So that basically unlocks a huge set of performance optimizations for this thing. And now let's take a look at what return type are we using. We're using this sum view. This is an opaque return type, which help us reduce the boilerplate because you can imagine that this type gets very complex pretty quickly and if we had to actually write this by ourselves it would be impossible to write uis so if we introduce this concept of opaque return types so we don't have to do that the compiler does it for ourselves the compiler knows that what we are returning here is this thing and it just interprets it like that. We don't have to write manually that, it reduces a lot of the boilerplate. I also have a video about that if you want to know more. It's super important to understand that this doesn't allow any dynamism. 
This is exactly one view, the view that we're returning here, it's exactly that type and it cannot be a different one, it cannot change, you cannot have multiple ones, it's just that specific one. Let's illustrate this to see what problems that causes. So here I just wrote a function that returns some view, and again this has to be a specific one, but of course what are we doing? Here we're returning different views, we're returning a text or a label. And the compiler is actually telling us that that cannot happen. It needs to be exactly the same type, no matter which return scenario you are in. And that's a problem, because we want to be able to implement this. We want to be able to, based on some state of our view, return one thing or another. But some view just doesn't let us do that. That's not like some magical dynamism that we can opt in. No, this is not that. So, historically, what can you do with this? You can basically change this to use any view. What is any view? Any view is what it's often called a type erased view in this case. Type erasure is a complex topic that probably deserves a video on its own, but it basically it's kind of a escape hatch. When you have a system with, that is so statically typed and so strongly typed, in some scenarios you want to obtain in some kind of dynamism, like in this case for example. But the system doesn't let you because it's strongly typed, you need to specify the generics and it gets complex very quickly. But there are legit cases where you don't want that. I want to actually have two different types working together here. That's where type erasure comes in. It basically lets you wrap your underlying types, forget about their own types and just use this type erased, in this case any view. Swift it's full of these from collection types that are type erased to the new combine with the any publisher, all of that, it's the same concept. You are trying to hide the underlying type to basically mix and match different types together. In this case, we can return any view here. And now the compiler is happy because even if we're returning different views, from the compiler point of view, it's just the same thing because what we're returning is just an any view. So that's the usage of any view. But this comes with some trade-offs, because as soon as you are doing this, you are opting out of all these performance enhancements and these cool things that I was talking about Swift UI when we were checking which type we use here. Because if you take a look here and we actually use this new view that we, are, that we created, you're gonna see that it's any view. So it doesn't know what it is. It doesn't know if it's a label, if it's a text, it cannot optimize. So every time this renders and this changes, the most likely scenario is that it needs to actually check and random a lot of things because it doesn't have the knowledge at compile time, it doesn't have the knowledge in the static type system. So that's a problem. This was kind of common before, but since Swift 5.3, Function Builders, which again is the feature that Swift UI uses to have this nice DSL, got a huge improvement with a lot of new features and I have a deep dive video talking about that that I recommend you to take a look if you haven't yet. That allows us if we're on the body property of a view, we can actually just write an if, return multiple things, different types inside the if, without any problem. And that's huge, because that immediately removed a lot of use cases from any view. But what's the problem? That you can only do that in the body, by default, and that's the key thing. The way that this works is by using function builders and the Swift UI DSL. That lets Swift UI know that you are inside the condition, that there are multiple types that you want to return, but Swift UI knows that. And how can we see that it knows that? Because as you can see here, it's using this private view, conditional content. So Swift UI has encoded in the type system in the same way that it was doing before with these two. It's encoded in the type system that there is a condition here. Condition that it doesn't know, it will have to check the condition at runtime, but at least it knows that this condition breaks the hierarchy in two scenarios. One scenario where there is a label and the other scenario where there is text. So as you can see, we're giving again more information to the Swift UI framework to perform all the optimizations it can to make things faster and quicker and use all the power of Swift. But as we were saying, this works by default on body. And it works by default because the way the DSL works, you need to mark a function as being a view builder. And by default, this property on the protocol of view, it's that by default. But we can use the same thing, the same technique on our own code. So we just need to go here and say this is a view builder. And now here in this world, we are again on a Swift DSL world. 
Before we were, we were just on a Swift function wall, the same code we have written all since the beginning, but now we can use all the power of the Swift DSL. So we can switch here again to use one specific concrete type to give more information to the system. And then we can just get rid of the returns and the any views and just write what we wanted to write since the beginning. And as you can see, this now works. And even if we use it, you will see that the type, it gets even more and more complex. So we are thankful to have these some views. So the compiler knows the types, but we don't have to. But they are the real types. There is no any view. There is no need for any view. So in conclusion, Swift UI wants you to use the specific types and it wants to know the more information as it can to make things perform on a runtime and to check basically less things at runtime. The less work you have to do, the more performant things are, plain simple. And to do that, it needs to embed all the information in the type system. Thankfully for us, we can use some view to not have to write that ourselves. And also, thankfully for us, we can use some kind of dynamic things like conditional views and not lose all that power. So if you really need conditional views on the stuff, please know that you have this tool, know that you can just need to write normal Swift. And if you are outside of the body property, you can use the view builder to do the same thing. Now, it's important to know that there are other circumstances where you really want a type race view with any view. And that's fine. You don't have to go crazy and avoid it in all the cases, but it's useful to know that we have these tools to try to avoid it as much as possible. So hopefully this gives you new tools to know what you are doing and take the best decision when you're writing UI code. And that's it for today. Thank you all for watching and see you next time.